Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Jazz, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, when I say I'm an alcoholic, I accept the fact that I have a disease called alcoholism. Uh, <clears throat> you're not going to hear a whole lot of me about being drunk. Uh, uh, I had a ton of trouble with alcoholism. Uh, I spent the last four years of my life uh, on Skid Row. Uh, it wasn't Skid Row in those days. You were just Johnny the Bum. Uh, my sobriety date is December 7th. 1962. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> before I got to Skid Row, uh, I was playing a lot of games with jail, and I prided myself with being a wise guy, etc., etc. And uh, I had a good job. I made good money. I stole more money than I made. <laughs> and. Uh, <clears throat> I'm from uh, South Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, up in South Boston, they had a, a nightclub called Glinstrom's uh, Village, and at that time, it was the biggest nightclub in uh, the country, I believe, and I, I rubbed elbows with Sarah Vaughan and Johnny Ray, and I, you know, I thought I was the king of the, king of the hill. Uh, at the end of my, uh, just before I got on Skid Row, uh, uh, I got fired for causing strikes. Uh, and I got sued for $50,000 and I didn't happen to have it. Uh, you know, my, my wife had long taken off with the kids, never to return till this day. And uh, I did what any grown man would do that lost his home. I went back to my mummy. Now, I am now I am now 27 years old and I haven't cut the umbilical cord yet. You know, and uh, you know, and uh, I had a habit of falling asleep with cigarettes and setting the house on fire. So I left this house and I went to my mother's house and I set her house on fire. And uh not actually, I bite smoke, and I didn't do it. You know, I wasn't a sparky. You know, and, and so, so anyway, she told me to get out, and I said, "Man, it's me." She says, "I I know who it is. Get out." <laughs> so so off I went. Within three months, I lost my job, I lost my house, and as quick as that, I was on the nut. You know. So I did everything you do when you're on the nut. I, I became a wine bum, and in those days there were no decoxes. There was no uh, uh, place to sleep. I slip out. You think this is cold? Try Boston in the middle of February. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, and, you know, I think the saddest part of my life was I, I didn't have a clue. I had no clue whatsoever what was wrong with me. You know, I continued. I tried to do the right thing. When I was 17, I was in the Army. I did well. I picked up a drink. I'm in the stockade. Nobody told me what it was wrong with me. I spent six months on the funny farm over to make a plan. Nobody mentioned alcohol. I got arrested numerous times. Nobody mentioned alcohol. Luckily, I got, <clears throat> I got picked up. They, they had a, I think Tom knows they had a, a game they played in, in Massachusetts. The first time you got drunk, you got a $5 fine that was put on file. The second time you got another $5 fine, you didn't pay that. The third time you got arrested, they say you owe us 10 bucks, you didn't pay us, so you owe us 10 days, and you went to Charles Street Jail, and you got detoxed. Uh, they had a little old nurse over there, and they backed the paddy wagon in. You remember the big patty? Some of you don't. With the brass, the brass bars, they back it in. The only way you could go out was to walk into the jail, and this lady would give you about that much uh, in, a, in a paper cup of formaldehyde, and you would drink that down. You'd think, me, Jesus, she was the angel from heaven. 
they'll put, knock you dead. Right? You wake up with an appetite like an elephant. You know, and that's how I was living. I eventually went to Bridgewater State Farm. I spent the summer, summer of 72 down there. Uh, I got out in September, Labor Day weekend. My mother had come down. God bless her. My mother needed me like she needed cancer. Never, ever was I a son. Never. Didn't bother me a bit. You know, I got out, I went to the state house, cast a check, walked into a bar room. I remember a guy I was on the bus with, he said to me, he's talking to me, he said, boy, if I do okay, I can stay out of there for a weekend. I said, stay out of where? He said, Bridgewater, where we just came from. I said, for a weekend? He said, yeah. I said, this weekend? He said, yeah. I said, how many times you down there? He said, 52. <laughs> I said, oh, I don't want to be that bad. Yeah. But my sponsor was to tell me he had the first one. It's like the first drink. No. I stayed sober for 90 days. After 90 days, with my self-centered attitude and my big shot attitude, I thought knowing what was wrong with me, I could take care of it by myself. I have a few pops and that would be it. I went out, I picked up a drink, and I lost seven days. In that seven days, somebody fixed my clock. They punched me out. I was all banged up. I woke up in my mother's house. In the 30 day, the 90 days I was sober, I went over to Jimmy and the Thieves in the South End. You could go over there with five, this is true, five bucks, sport coat, pair of pants, right? Shirt, and a, a three-piece Gillette hook, razor blade. You know, and I got all pissed out like the Duke of the Welly. Here I am. Look at me coming, girls. I'm all set, right? All my, I woke up, all my stuff was gone. Whoever pounded me out took my clothes. You know? And the only thing I need to remember is that day, December 7th. I woke up in my mother's house. She had the, the shopping bag packed. <laughs> that, that was my luggage. You know? and, I, and I remember waking up and there was my sponsor. And I said, how'd you know where I was? He said, the word is out. So I, I didn't know what to say. If you're new around here, you're coming back. Or if you're not having a good time in this program, you know what it's like. You know what it's like, that self-centered shame and guilt and pride. You know, the loneliness that, oh, Jesus, I did it again. Huh? And I said to him, what's up, he says. He says, how you feel? And I said, I've had better days. <laughs> and the only thing I have to remember is this word, this sentence. He said, why don't you come back? And I looked at him, I said, are you telling me I come back to this program? He said, positively. I've been back ever since. I went after this program like you wouldn't believe, for all the wrong reasons. I don't want to talk anymore about drunk. I want to talk about the first 10 years that I was in this program. Miserable. <laughs> I hated every inch of it. Didn't like you. Are you laughing? I couldn't stand people that lie. Laugh! I'm only kidding. <laughs> don't take me serious. <laughs> that reminds me of a joke. Old Patty there, he worked, he worked in a brewery over in uh, Dublin, you know, and uh, God doesn't, he fall in the vat and he drowns. So Mike, the foreman, he's got to go down and tell Bridgie. He goes down to Bridgie, the wife, and he says, Bridget, he says, I got to tell you. He says, uh, we have some problems. He says, what's that? He says, uh, Patty fell in the vat. He died. He drowned in the vat. Oh, my God, she says. And she thinks for a minute, and she says, uh, uh, can I ask you something? She said, Nicky. He, he says, sure, what is it? She says, did he suffer? And he thinks about it. He says, no, he says, I don't think so. He says, I counted three times he went to the men's room before he did himself in.
So where were we? Anyway, I come back, right? And I chase this program, you would not believe it. Nine meetings a week, four times on a weekend. I was speaking like I could, I could talk a hungry dog off a meat truck. <laughs> but, I mean, I was all over New England. You know, it was an anniversary speak. Up up in Boston, they have anniversary group. Uh, they have a big celebration. You know, I was speaking at eight of them a year. I was running up and down South Boston trying to figure out where I could find a guy that could take a group picture of myself. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I really thought I had my act together. Well, no. Mad, angry, all the time. My fuse was about that, that long. Right off the nut I'd go. I come to a point in my sobriety where I never thought I was going to get drunk. I never was afraid to get drunk. I was always afraid that I was going to go to the funny farm and I was going to be sober. <clears throat> You wouldn't believe it. It was, whatever you do, don't drink, don't drink, don't drink. I was invited to speak at an anniversary over the St. Anthony's Shrine in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I was over there. I, I'm telling you, I was in trouble. And Whitey from Jamaica Plain, uh, he asked me if I, if I would speak there. So he came over, how you doing, Jazz? I said, pretty good, Whitey. How are you? He said, say hello to Henry. Say, hi, Henry, how are you? And Whitey takes off. So he says, how are you doing? So I told him how I was doing. I said, I don't know what I'm doing here with all these cuckoo clocks. I said, I'm crazier than they are. I said, you know, I said, and I'm effing and SOB and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Whitey comes back and he says to me, how are you making up with Father Henry? Oh, gee. <laughs> Father Henry. Now we got the apology. Sorry about that, Father. You know, blah, 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 so on and so forth. You know, and so you know, I'm copping out, and I said, I, it's, it's got to be the grace of God. I said to this man, and I had a deep-seated resentment about the Catholic Church. Had it for years and years. I went to a thing I was totally wrong, and a priest threatened to put me in jail, and I got a resentment. And I held on to it. For 14 years. And it got bigger and bigger. So he said to me, I said to him, do you know any psychiatrists? He said, why? I said, I told him. I said, listen to me. I'm as crazy as a bed bug. He said to me, well, why don't you talk to me? I said, look, I do not need this. I do not need it. He says, why don't you try it? I said, no, thank you. I walked away. I stopped, I turned around, and I said, okay, I'll give it a go. Grace of God, in my mind. Right? And the deal was, if you want to talk to me, you have to get involved with the 12 steps. And I said, I don't want to talk to you that bad. <laughs> <laughs> And he said to me, see you later. I agreed. I agreed to do it. I was told, is where I stopped. Here's what we do. You get a sponsor. You join a group. You get on your knees in the morning. You ask God to help you to stay away from a drink. And if you're lucky enough to make it, you get on your knees at night and you thank him. Ten years. Thank you, God. Get on your knees. Ba 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 ba. And now I'm introduced to under the gun the twelve steps. I am a book person. I love the big book. If you don't want to listen about the big book, pick up a book and read or take a nap or Whatever you do when you don't want to listen to anything. Right? I really and truly, for the first time in my sober life, consider the first step. I'm powerless over alcohol. And my life is unmanageable. Right? I held on to that like it was, it, like it was my life. You know? 
That's as far as I went. I will give you the fact that I was powerless over alcohol. But my defiance, defiance of an alcoholic, and the denial of the, the, the pain of alcoholism was right in there, thick, thick. No. But don't tell me my life is unmanageable. See, I'm a wise guy. I know all the answers. I, I, I've been there. I've been down that road. And I thought about it. And if my life is unmanageable, it would stand to reason I have to get something to manage it. Then you know where I'm going. Oh, the big book calls it a higher power. Yeah. Power greater than ourselves. Up until the second step. Quantum leap. <laughs> yeah. Where do they take me? Yeah. Do I really believe that I am powerless? Do I really believe that I have to go outside of myself, the ego of the year, to ask an unknown quantity for help? And I decided to. I decided to take the third step, where I became willing to ask God for help. ABC, they read it tonight, page 60. I can't, God can, I believe I'll let him. No. But the greatest thing, greatest discovery of my life today is the grace of God. It's right here. It's the only thing I have going is the grace of God, but by the same token, it's everything. I have a power in my life that would make the Niagara Falls look like a dripping faucet. I'm serious. There is nothing in my life that my higher power cannot and will not take care of if I would but ask him. Now you're talking to an alcoholic and you're telling him to be humble. Self-centered to the nth degree and you want me to humble myself before a higher power. So I said, yeah, I'll do it. He said, oh, oh, no, 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 no. You're not going to do it now. You're going to take a fourth step. He said, a fourth step about what? I'm an alcoholic. What else is there? Everything. See, the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous, to me, is when I, where I'm powerless over alcohol and my life is unmanageable. That's the beginning of my recovery. It's not the end of it. It's the beginning of it. It's where I start become well. So I took an inventory. I don't don't take inventories. If you're out there, don't take an inventory to find out what a great big badass you are. <laughs> There's nobody in this room that's that good at being that bad. <laughs> don't do it to yourself. If you're sitting in this hall tonight where there are an alcoholic or a member of Al-Anon, or you're just here because you got nothing else to do. <laughs> no. You're okay. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. You are okay. You're here because God put you here. This, this is, look at us. I don't, how many people in here? Yes, give me 200, 200, 200. 200 miracles. Fascinating. 200 people in this hall that have the possibility of becoming the greatest thing they can be in their own personal life. Now tell me, did you ever see a lousy miracle? Oh. You're worthy. You deserve goodness. Right? And now we're going to take a fourth step. I know all about this. I've got it all written down. And he says, you got to talk to somebody. Uh, you know, this guy, this priest, he's getting worse by the month. <laughs> you know, I don't know about anybody in this hall. I was brought up with this one thing. The major, major law in my kitchen. If you ever, ever in your life tell anybody 
what goes on in this kitchen. My father's favorite expression was, I will break your spine. <laughs> and now we got the one in here telling me I got to talk to somebody. I got to blow the whistle on myself. Try it. I did it. And you know what? It was like I opened the floodgates on Moon Island. All a crap. It didn't all go, but it started to go. Bad headache I got. Bad headache. You know, if you're out there and you've you got pressure going, you've got negativity going along, you're sick, you don't think you can handle it, you're carrying that around, dump it. Get rid of it. Talk to somebody. Everybody in this hall that is sick at this particular point in the negative, it's simple as this, you're carrying a secret around. So now I got all this stuff, I talked about it, I ventilated, I did all the things I was supposed to do. And he says to me, now we can go to work. Now you have to be willing to have these things removed. Now, you know, how am I going to survive? Anybody here ever think that your character defects were survival techniques? That's not, not a nice way to say I'm all screwed up and I should be. Huh? No. It's what I have to do. The big book says, in the big book it says, if you want to know why we think you should take a fifth step, We'll tell you. Do you want me to tell you? If you don't, you're apt to get drunk. Pretty good reason to take it. You don't have to believe it. You have to believe anything around here. I don't have to believe anything. You know the only two things I had to develop in my 47 years around here is the willingness to practice In the third step, in the 12 and 12, it says the whole key to this program is how good we develop, develop the ability to turn our wills and our lives over the care of God as we understand Him. That's what the book says. I get up this morning. I haven't asked God to help me to stay away from a drink for mm, 35 years. The audacity that I would ask God to help me. I say the third step prayer and the seventh step prayer every morning. Every morning I say it. God isn't designating me as his boss. I've got to talk to God. I need to beg God. I need to say, please God, Jesus Christ, don't let me do it. My higher power had a birthday nine or ten days ago. That's my higher power, Jesus Christ. In the big book, uh, Bill Wilson re re talks about Christ being a pretty decent person who had a lot of followers that didn't pay any attention to him. That was me for ten years. Pretty good at the audience, pretty good at the meetings. Didn't pay any attention to it. So if I'm at that point in my life, now I'm starting to get a little bit, I'm worried. I talked about my guilt and my shame and my remorse. The biggest problem I had was fear. I was, brought to, I was born and brought up to believe that God is out to get me. That everything I did, I could hear him saying, I know that you're lily white ass down there, Jazz, and you're going to pay. But well, really... <laughs> I'm already paying. I'm on skid row. I'm freezing to death. So I had to make a list of people that I had harmed. Big list. Telephone book. No, people that I harmed. The serious ones. You know, my mother. My kids. My wife. No. I wanted to go make amends to the bartender. Because I, you know, I figured if I broke out somewhere along this AA trip, I, I wouldn't be bad. 
I want to make sure he, he remembered me. You know? I remember I walked by a guy that knew me as a bum, and he said to me, I haven't seen you. You look pretty good. I said, yeah, I saw over nine years. He said, well, you saw over nine years. I saw you in a car stop three weeks ago. Nobody remembers. I'm not that important. So I make a list of amends. You know, honest to God, I made an amend to my mother in my 18th year of sobriety. 18 years of justifying my behavior under those levels. So I made my amends. You know the problem was with that? I forgot to put my name on the list. For years in this program, I was the people pleaser of the year. Oh, Johnny boy, go get it. Just wait there. Sit. I'll get it. I'd be running down the street sober. I'd stop. I'd say, am I going someplace? Am I coming back? No. I made my amends. I apologize every time I speak now to people who might have heard me speak the first ten years I was sober. (laughs) I apologize for it. If you're out there tonight and you're suffering, you don't need to hear me about my drunk. You want to know how do you stop the pain? You don't stop it. Every pain that I have, every pain that I suffer, I don't suffer anymore. It's a spiritual experience. If I feel bad right now, it's as simple as this. I'm not trusting my higher power. As simple as that. No. What can I do? Next time you got a problem, keep it a secret for four or five months. Try to work it out and see how you end up. <laughs> you know? And if you and, and when you and when you get di- discharged from the funny farm, call up your spiritual advisor. <laughs> see, I, I am not knocking what's going on. I'm simply telling you, it didn't work for me. See, I'm one of those people. I, I'm an alcoholic. You know, do you ever hear anybody say, do you want a little sip out of this bottle? And you, you say, yeah. I say, no, I want the bottle. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. I, we have a magic step, step 10. Right? If I wake up tomorrow with a negative thought, it's unhealthy. It's wrong. I don't mean wrong bad. I'm talking about it's wrong for my sobriety. I need to talk to somebody. When? Promptly. Do not procrastinate it. Because by the time you procrastinate it for five minutes, you'll talk yourself out of it. That's what we do. A miracle. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm going to admit to somebody that I made a mistake. Huh? Huh? Really? You're really going to do it, Jazz? Yeah, I'm going to do it. (laughs) The greatest defense mechanism in the world. Somebody's muffing, they say, you know what you did to me? And I say, did I do that? Yeah. Gee, I'm sorry. Now, you don't know what I'm saying under my breath, but I'm saying, I'm sorry. And, And where can they go? There's no place to go. Tenth step. Confession to God. I want to get out. I want to be sorry. And it hurts so much to make that 10th step in the beginning, you start to get better simply because it hurts so much. It caught up. My favorite step was the 11th step. Where we seek through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with who? God. And what are we praying for? We're praying for sobriety. No, we're praying to carry out his will. For the knowledge of his will. Why? So that we can work at it. And we want the power to carry that out. We're back to power again. Higher power. I I push meditation like you will not believe. And people say, uh, well, I tried meditation. It didn't work. Well, 
you could give an alcoholic try like uh, three minutes for four days. Huh? Uh, how about how about if we spend half the time that we threw up, or half the time that we screwed up, trying to learn how to meditate? How many people out here know how to worry? Everybody here know how to worry? Give me an answer. You're all loud. Do you all want? Yeah, look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, for your information, worry is meditation in the negative. <laughs> so we can do it. Any, my, my spiritual advisor said to me, any time I said I can't do it, he would say, I know that. You told me that back on page 60. <laughs> I can't? What? Yeah. No, God can. Am I? He can. I don't think you're talking about Tommy. <laughs> I can't? Who can? God. Yeah, you got it. Now, how many people are going to let him? Yeah, there you go. Not a bad deal. And look at me. Look at me. Here's a joke about the guy that got out of work. He goes to happy hour. Some of my friends heard this joke, right? He's happy hour. He's got to take a ferry over the island where he lives. Jeez, he looks up. at 7 o'clock, the last ferry. So he drops his drink. He runs down. He, he sees the, the ferry going out. And he's really legging it down the road there. And geez, the ferry's going out. And he, he takes a dive and he does a belly flop on the deck. Then, whew, he gets to the guy, Jesus, I'm lucky. He said, I just made it. The guy says it would have been a lot easier the way we tucked in. <laughs> you, you other guys will get it later. <laughs> so here I am. Mrs. Fleming's number one son, number two son, in all his glory, all spanked up, I got to a 12 step. Huh? 12 step. What a step. Having had a spiritual awakening. How? As the result of these steps. I think there's an indication there that we practice the first 11 steps in order to have a spiritual awakening. Wow. My God. What do they say? If you don't have it, you can't give it away. This is not a drunk program. It's about recovering from alcoholism. I've had a spiritual awakening in my mind Tonight I'm trying to carry the message of the 12 steps. And you know, in the 12 and 12, if you read the 12 step, there's two pages on having had a spiritual awakening, and then, and there's two pages on uh, carrying the message. And lo and behold, in case you don't know it, there's 14 pages on practicing these principles in all of our affairs. Not when I'm at an AA meeting. Not when my sponsor's got his eye on me. <laughs> you know, not when I'm trying to impress the public, but in all of my affairs. I had an old time at one time. I had three years of sobriety, and I was wearing it. You would not believe how I wore my sobriety. I'll tell you one story about my aunt. I went home one day, 90 days sober. I'm living with my mother. I'm not paying any rent. I'm selling blood to, to keep the monkey off my back in the courthouse. And I look at my supper. It's roast beef. You know, I said to my mother, what's this? You're laughing, Tom, yeah? You been there? Uh, you've been there. Huh? Now you go home and say, hey, wait a minute. No. She says, it's your supper. I says, that's it? She says, no. She's, she's looking at me like Johnny Bunham is going on. He's going to go off the deep end again. Right? So she says, 
what's wrong? I says, do you know that I'm sober 90 days? And my aunt is sitting over there, my aunt, my favorite aunt. She says, I haven't been drinking for 74 years. <laughs> didn't, didn't face me. I said to my mother, and another thing, we got to get rid of her. <laughs> Look at me. I don't do that now. I haven't ripped the phone out of the wall for years. <laughs> Anybody here ever practice breaking windows? <laughs> huh? Huh? You try to punch a window out without cutting your hand? I could do it. Don't know how anymore, thank God. I remember when I came out of Bridgewater, I learned how to, Chuck knows how to, how to roll a cigarette one hand. Now, uh, you kids, oh, you two, you, you lick it. No, one hand. I <laughs> I, I weighed 135 pounds and I tried to be John Wayne. Jesus, couldn't do anything right. But all kidding aside, you know, I, I, I got a thing about Alcoholics Anonymous. Boy, I see you kids out there and uh, don't let me threaten you. I'm not trying to frighten you. I'm trying to give you a message. A lot of people here are going to go out and try it again. Mission impossible. All I'm saying to you is, someday, wherever you are, whoever you're with, if it's booze, know that we're here. Know that Alcoholics Anonymous is here. And there's nothing like Alcoholics Anonymous for success. If you know and you don't like being here, it's very normal. If you're new and you like being here, I think you've got a problem. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, I mean, this, this to me was smoke. I mean, I don't want to try to impress you, but all we're saying to you, and if you're new, don't believe me. For Christ's sake, what am I? If any luck, you'll ever see me again. No, no. Get a hold of the book. And if somebody says to you, read the fifth chapter first, please don't read the fifth chapter first. If Alcoholics Anonymous wanted you to read the fifth chapter first, they would have made a chapter one. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't you? When was the last time you picked up a book and went to the fifth chapter? It doesn't make sense. No. I'm not, don't let, don't let anybody take charge of your life. Let somebody help you to take charge of your spirituality. The big book says that we need to get a spiritual advisor. That's what the big book says. I'm not knocking it. It doesn't, there's nothing in the big book about, I'm talking about the first, the text of the big book. 164 pages. Do you know, there's 164 pages between, between God, spirituality, Etc. It's mentioned two hundred and something times. One hundred and sixty-four pages in God is, and spirituality is mentioned over two hundred times. What is it? We're not reading it. Why are we not seeing that? Is our defiance so heavy that we'd rather talk about being drunk than talk about the grace of God and the wonders and miracles of this program? You are sitting in a seat that no other person in the world is going to sit in. Grab the seat of it. Pull your ass in tight. Stay here. It's the only place you can go where you're going to be accepted. And I promise you this. I'm going to get on my knees tonight, and I'm going to say my third and seventh step prayer. And I'm going to say, what a night Jazz had. What a night Mrs. Fleming's number two son had. He had the privilege the joy, and the message to a bunch of wonderful, wonderful people. And when I'm down there, and I'm going to say, please, God, Jesus Christ, please, give them a day of sobriety. And thank you.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.